I'm Ian Hanamansing in Toronto. Behind me, the scene of a horrific attack. This is what it looked like along Young Street just after lunchtime. First responders tending to people on the sidewalk where a van jumped the curb and mowed people down one after another. A beautiful spring day on a busy area of the city ending in tragedy. Tonight, we'll walk you through what we know about what happened. Also, what we're learning about the suspect. Why officials say there isn't a larger national security threat. And how those vehicles, like that van, are all too often used as weapons, just as they have been here in London. This is The National. Ten innocent bystanders killed, 15 others injured. The murder weapon, a rental van. It happened just hours ago when this street became the scene of sudden panic and deadly destruction. It's a horrific scene. It's, uh, it's something that I don't think anybody can be prepared for. At about 1.30 p.m., a white van jumped the curb and plowed into a number of pedestrians before speeding away. First responders treated victims on the bloodstained sidewalk, and 10 patients were taken to the city's major trauma center at Sunnybrook Hospital. The emergency department under lockdown as a safety precaution because no one really knew the nature of the attack. It happened near the corner of Young and Finch in the city's north end. Police apprehended the white van south of the crash site and arrested the sole occupant in a dramatic confrontation. The name of the alleged driver is Alec Manassian. He's a 25-year-old from Richmond Hill, Ontario, north of Toronto. His LinkedIn profile says he's a student at Seneca College. The government says the suspect is not associated with any threat to national security. As witnesses took in the terrible chain of events, their faces were etched with the grief and horror. CBC News has learned a lot more about the suspect. More on that in a moment, but first, Joanna Remiliotis takes us through what happened. The horror of the aftermath is in the details. The discarded paramedic gloves, the bodies still lying on the pavement. Kenneth Wu saw the van strike a woman, then locked eyes with the man behind the wheel. He was looking at me and then he saw that old lady and he turned left a little bit to hit the lady on the sidewalk. And then he started driving down. As soon as he passed my car, he turned around, he looked at me face to face. That's why I saw he was a very angry and scared young guy. Wu says the van braked, then sped off again, driving on the sidewalk for several more blocks, hitting one pedestrian after another. Kasra Ibrahimi watched in shock. I saw the van, it was a white van, uh, as I remember, it was on the, it was exactly in the sideway, and when it gets, because it's, it, it was, looks like a movie, the, the, it hits a pill and he will like fly, things like that, it was super scary, yeah. Nana Agyeman Badu rushed to help a woman who tried to jump out of the way. And the lady was coming north, uh, coming north, beside a bar shedder, and, and she saw the car coming, and she, she tried to, uh, stand aside, but she was not lucky. She got pinned into the bar shelter, the, the, the grass, and um, it, uh, she, she was pushed uh, backwards, lying down with all the uh, glasses on top of her, broken glasses on top of her with, with cuts. The terror continued for several more blocks. Witnesses saw a baby stroller fly into the air saw the van plow into a group of people before finally stopping. I saw the, like, I don't know, how can I say it, the car, car seat from a baby going up like that. I don't know the baby hitting or not. I hopefully, yeah, hopefully the baby was fine. After a dramatic police standoff, the man was arrested at the scene. This is going to be a long investigation with multiple witnesses, with a lot of uh, surveillance cameras. Hours later, dozens of officers and the coroner were still here, assessing the carnage. The victims still here too. And people continue to line the streets. Colin Gervais lives around the corner. I came out here to just pay my respects to these people because it could have been me easily this morning. It could have been me if I hadn't had a doctor's appointment today, if, I, if I, my schedule had been slightly different, it might have been me walking in front of here. I couldn't believe that it was at basically our doorstep. Um, it made me really nervous and sad to think that a lot of families have lost their loved one or they didn't know where they were and they couldn't uh, situate them. So I'm just glad that we're safe, but um, 
Yeah. Our hearts are with uh, all of the families who lost somebody today. And Joanna is here with us now. Uh, the police chief speaking this evening. What's the latest from him? Well, the crime scene is still an active one, and it's a big one. It stretches up almost a kilometer um, down that way. And we spoke to a couple of officers on the scene. They're going to be here for at least a couple of days. And police are pleading with the public to send in anything that they have, any pieces, snippets of video, any eyewitness accounts, because they literally do want to piece this and construct this timeline as accurately as possible. The question, of course, so many had as soon as this happened and still do tonight is motive. What do we know about that? They're not speaking specifically about motive. They're not ruling anything out yet. But here's what the Toronto's police chief had to say about motive. We're all putting our, our pieces together to see exactly what we have. And at this particular point in time, there's nothing that does affect the national security footprint. We are looking very strongly to what the exact motive or motivation was for this particular uh, incident to take place. And at the end of the day, we will have a fulsome answer and we'll have a fulsome account as to what the conclusion of this is. I will just say uh, to people that I hope that they will understand, as I know they do, people who live in the city, who have come to the city from around the world, this is not, this kind of tragic incident is not representative of how we live or who we are or anything to do with uh, life in the city on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis. And that I hope people will reflect on that, will reaffirm that, will go to work tomorrow and perhaps uh, offer, as sometimes is the case in churches, a sign of peace to each other, uh, just in some small way to acknowledge that we're going to uh, carry on with heavy hearts, but that we're going to carry on with a life that is uh, admired around the world and that we will do that in the way that Torontonians do things. People across the country are thinking about what's happening here in Toronto and are thinking about the family and the victims so um, I just want to again thank everyone who has been uh, who has been so ready to support and to encourage anyone who has information as the mayor and the chief have said to come forward so reassuring words from Ontario's premier and Toronto's mayor but this investigation it will take a long time and for sure there'll be more to hear about tomorrow okay Joanna, thank you very much You're welcome so as we've heard, officials saying there is no national security threat, at least none that they have found. But CBC News has learned more about the suspect in custody, Alec Manassian. Here's and what may have motivated him. Our senior investigative correspondent, Diana Swain, has been looking into that angle. And Diana, what have you learned? Well, as you've said, there's no indication so far that authorities have that this was motivated by terrorism or by political views. Why then? So here's what we've learned so far about the man behind the wheel and what might have motivated him to do this. This cell phone video shows the driver as he steps out of the van into the line of a police officer who has his weapon drawn. That driver has now been identified as 25-year-old Alec Manassian. Watch as he gestures, appearing to try to provoke the Toronto police officer into firing on him. And listen as he yells at the officer to shoot him. Come on, get down. Come on, get down. Tonight, Manassian is in custody. As police search for a motive, one possible explanation is circulating online, suggesting Manassian was angry over being rebuffed by women. In what appears to be a post on Facebook, in which a man with the same name and picture as Manassian refers to the Supreme Gentleman, Elliot Roger. Hi, Elliot Roger here. In fact, Roger was responsible for a deadly rampage in Isla Vista, California in 2014, killing six people and injuring over a dozen more. Tomorrow is the day of retribution, the day in which I will have my revenge against humanity. A video Roger posted just beforehand raged about successive women turning down his advances. All because girls have never been attracted to me. In that video, men who always seemed to win with women were referred to as chads, Stacy's, the women who turned men down, rendering those like Roger incels or involuntarily celibate. This posting, apparently from Manassian, says the incel rebellion has already begun. We will overthrow all the chads and Stacy's. CBC News has not been able to independently verify the post as being made by Manassian. There is no indication so far that he targeted any specific person as he plowed down the sidewalk, but rather aimed his vehicle at anyone in his path. 
So, Dan, a lot to digest there. Uh, tell us more about what, what you know in this case. There's not a whole lot more about him on social media, Ian. What we did find was his LinkedIn profile, in which it says he's a Seneca College student. That's a college here in Toronto. He appears to have been a student there for some time. It says from 2011 to present day. So we're talking seven years. It seems he was developing an app, an app that would help you find free parking spots in Toronto. Beyond that, based on the footage, we don't believe he was seriously injured in any way as he was taken into custody. All right, Diana Swain, thank you. As Diana mentioned there in her piece, a group name that you've probably never heard of before, incels or involuntary celibate. Their brand of conversation has been banned from websites like Reddit. And whether Manassian really does count himself amongst those so-called incels isn't confirmed, but what does it mean anyway to brand yourself as one? Ishmael Darrow is a journalist with BuzzFeed who's dug into some of this. Good to see you. So so what what are what is this group of people, if you were going to break it down for us? Well, it's in the name, right? It's involuntarily celibate. These are young young people, mostly men, who feel that they have been forced into celibacy, that, that they haven't had success with uh, women in uh, romantic and sexual relationships. And over time, you know, that can really curdle into some really uh, resentful sentiments uh, about women in general. And does it, or has it, I guess it has, but does it normally take the form of violence? Well, I think that for a lot of people, you know, these terms, there's a, there's a heavy layer of irony. So it's sure. not uncommon for somebody to, you know, between relationships maybe to jokingly say, you know, I'm involuntarily celibate. But for people within uh, communities where they very seriously self-identify as that, it is a little more barbed. And there's often very strong anti-woman and anti-feminist language uh, where these young men often feel like they are owed relationships and they're owed sex and uh, and when that doesn't happen they can they can get quite angry so would you say it's a subgroup sort of of marginalized young people or is it something slightly more dangerous and nefarious well i think it's impossible to um take this out of the larger world of online you know, communities where often young men they might join and, and not really have their identities totally molded yet mm -hmm. but over time uh, you see this on communities like reddit or 4chan um, posting enough and finding this community, it can actually maybe radicalize you further than you even realized when you first joined this group, where you might only have wanted to post some memes or yeah. trade some jokes with other young men. You use the word radicalize, which is an interesting choice of words here. And I wonder, is there chatter tonight about this incident? Is there someone claiming responsibility or the group celebrating in some way? I think it's still very early and probably too early to say, but I wouldn't be surprised if uh, on some of these darker corners of the web, where um, a certain kind of uh, reactionary politics has developed in the last few years. If, uh, if you were to look tonight, I think you might see, um, you, you might see some sympathy. Um, again, it's very early to say, but I wouldn't sure. be surprised if, if he becomes an icon, sort of like Elliot Roger became to the same community. And again, we, we have not confirmed that this uh, association is there on those, on those web pages that Diana mentioned. Would it surprise you to see that it was, or is this maybe more common than we think? Um, I think, again, it's too early, but, but the fact that this post that we're talking about did specifically cite Elliot Roger, who has become a bit of a strange martyr figure in certain uh, parts of the web, mm -hmm. I, I think you can't see that connection. Okay. Ishmael Daro, thanks for uh, helping us understand something none of us really knew about until today. Thanks. Federal security officials and leaders from all levels of government are keeping a close eye on the Toronto situation. Katie Simpson has more on the security threat in this country. Canada's public safety minister is being careful with his words, saying it is irresponsible to speculate. There would appear to be no national security connection to this particular incident. Ralph Goodale happened to be in Toronto today to host a meeting of public safety and security ministers from G7 countries. He says the incident is unrelated to the meetings and there's no need to raise Canada's national security threat level. I think it's important to state this. There is no information uh, available to me at the present time that would lead us to conclude that there should be a change in risk level. That threat level sits at medium, which is where it has been since the 2014 shooting on Parliament Hill. After that attack, major public events across the country, including Canada Day celebrations, now involve intense visible security. 
That level hasn't changed even after high-profile incidents like the U-Haul attack in Edmonton, the thwarted ISIS attack in Strathroy, Ontario, and the mosque shooting in Quebec City. Our thoughts are obviously with those affected by this incident. We are still gathering information, and as soon as we can, we will share more information with Canadians. The Prime Minister and national security agencies are monitoring the situation and cooperating with Toronto Police as it leads this investigation. The RCMP will only take over the case if it is a national security incident. We are all unsettled and, uh, and very disturbed by a situation like this. I think it's impossible not to be. It's frightening. Tomorrow's G7 national security and public safety meetings will go ahead as planned. And while this incident is not a national security investigation, it certainly will be discussed among these allies. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Toronto. The Prime Minister has released a statement in response to the attack that happened this afternoon. It says, in part, On behalf of all Canadians, I offer my heartfelt condolences to the loved ones of those who were killed and my thoughts for a fast and full recovery to those injured. I thank the first responders at the scene who managed this extremely difficult situation with courage and professionalism. He adds, of course, that they are and continue to watch the situation closely. Adrian is in London, happens to be there on another assignment for us tonight. But you are, Adrian, on Westminster Bridge, and we saw a violent attack there last March. Indeed, Rosie, London's had to learn very quickly how to deal with these sorts of vehicle attacks. Last year, uh, in three separate incidents, three separate vehicle attacks, a dozen people were killed, including a Canadian. And so we'll have a look at how the United Kingdom is trying to mitigate that threat in a moment. But first, let's have a look at how and sometimes why vehicles are being used as weapons. Quebec 2014, Martin Couturelo sat in a parking lot for two hours before stepping on the gas and ramming his vehicle into two Canadian soldiers. Warrant officer Patrice Vincent was killed. Another person was injured. The working thesis is that it's, it's a deliberate act. With regards to how far was it planned, it's, it's really hard to say. Couturelo fled from police but was stopped and killed a short time later. Vehicles have been used for decades to kill people, but it was in 2010 when terror groups started instructing extremists on how to use rental vans and trucks. And the frequency of those kinds of attacks seems to be on the rise. Very easy to obtain. You can steal a driver's license if you had to and still get one of these rental vehicles, so they're ubiquitous. It's, it's a white vehicle, very hard. Um, blends into everyday society and uh, it's just it's it causes great great damage and not only that if you're the driver you're somewhat protected even as police around the world are becoming more aware of the threat the attacks have been getting deadlier in July 2016 86 people were killed while celebrating Bastille Day in France when a man in a rental truck plowed through a promenade more than a dozen people died when a man in a rented van rammed into a group of pedestrians on a street in Barcelona. And London was targeted three times at a local mosque on the London Bridge and right here on Westminster Bridge. And so after the Westminster uh, Bridge attack right here, there was panic in the city, as you can imagine, and, and there was an effort by Scotland Yard to look at some 33 bridges in London and put barriers up on all of them. A decision was made not to put barriers on the London Bridge. That decision, unfortunately, came 24 hours before the attack on the London Bridge. So there are physical protections they're undertaking. Rental car companies, interestingly, Rosie, have said, you know, what can we do? So they're looking for a way to do real-time checks of clients against national terror databases to make sure they find out that they're not renting a truck to someone who's on a watch list. And the police have now been told that they can shoot at moving vehicles. That's not something you could do here, but the decision has been made that, you know, it's too important because if you're chasing a vehicle and it's still going, there's a chance it's part of an attack and you have to stop it. So those are some pretty extreme, maybe preventative measures. Canada is also sort of being cautious and trying to prevent this. What, what are people doing here, authorities here? 
Well, you're seeing it more often. You know, you're seeing dump trucks parked across pedestrian uh, streets when, when there are big festivals underway. At the start of baseball season in Toronto, a large part of the downtown core around uh, the stadium were blocked off to cars. That was new, but this is part of, of that awareness that police have that these are just, you know, for attackers, these are crimes of opportunity. And these vehicles are so easily obtained. It's so low tech. They blend in so easily. And all of that is just so frustrating uh, for police. It's important to note, Rosie, that we are hearing tonight from the company that, that rented that vehicle today. And that company's name is Ryder. It issued a statement saying, in part, we are saddened by this tragic event and our deepest sympathies go out to those impacted. We take the safety and security of our entire fleet very seriously and we are cooperating fully with authorities. We have much more for you on this developing story tonight. Ten families are grieving. Fifteen more worried about their injured loved ones. We'll tell you what we know about the people behind those numbers. We have more on the police officer who took down the alleged attacker in a remarkable act of bravery. Toronto is a city where many are mourning, but also a city where tens of thousands of people have gathered tonight for a hockey playoff game. We'll take you through the security measures and the mood. This is The National. It's very clear, uh, just from a general perspective, to say that uh, the actions uh, definitely look deliberate. The latest from police as they investigate today's deadly van attack in North Toronto that left 10 people dead. Police believe it was likely intentional, but what they're still trying to figure out, motive, what the driver was thinking. The suspect, 25-year-old Alec Minassian. But before today, he wasn't on police's radar, and so far, officials say there's no sign he's connected to any terrorist organization. Tonight, of course, there are many questions about the suspect, but what likely matters most to the injured victims and their families right now is recovery. Ten of them were transported to Toronto's Sunnybrook Hospital, not too far from the scene of the attack, and that's where CBC's Natalie Collada is standing by. So, Natalie, you've been there for a few hours now. Describe the scene for us. What's been happening there? Well, Andrew, it's perhaps not altogether surprising when you're outside a hospital to see worried family members running in to the ER, but that is what we have been seeing over the last little while. As we know, uh, people inside, hospital officials as well as police, try and track down the family members of those inside who are being treated. We know that inside it was an emotional place. We spoke to one man who said he knew at one point that there were individuals who did not make it, who had died, that had passed away, that were in the ER. Here's what he had to say. Take a listen. You could tell that they pulled the uh, the curtains around her after if the whole team was in there working on her. But it was very, very sad. A lot, a lot, a, so much going on. And that they were all, the doctors and the interns were all so cool about it was, was what was amazing. And of course, detectives that we have been speaking to have told us they have been trying their best to communicate with those individuals inside who were victims of this attack, who can communicate, trying, of course, to get as much information as they can as they continue in their investigation. We know that there is a lot to go through. We had the opportunity as well to, to speak to an acting supervising uh, individual who works with the paramedics, the EMS services, to talk a little bit about what he saw on the scene coming out of the hospital here after he had been here. Here's what he had to say. Take a look. Young and Finch all the way down to Young and Shepherd, uh, just pure carnage. Um, debris everywhere. Um, uh, this area is of, I can't really describe it. There's just, there's just victims everywhere. Now, earlier in the evening, we were told that of the 10 people that were brought here to hospital, two arrived with what they call vital signs ab absent and were pronounced dead. Five were at the time reported in critical injury, uh, critical condition, three with serious, in serious condition. But that, of course, is expected to evolve as the night progresses. Andrew. All right. Natalie Collada outside Toronto's Sunnybrook Hospital. Thanks very much. 
And let's turn back to Ian, because as is often the case when we're talking about survivors of a violent attack, the hours and the days to come can be a difficult time. Something, Ian, you could also say is true for the whole city. That's right, Andrew. The city certainly pulling together tonight. Uh, take a look at this shot of the Toronto skyline, the CN Tower, dark tonight in the wake of the attack. From a distance, Toronto looks just the same as always. It felt that way taking the subway northward uh, to this scene. But if you look closely, especially around here, a lot has changed. That reputation, a safe and welcoming place in doubt for many tonight. Uh, the attack shocking so many people. And as David Common learned, it's shattering an illusion held by many residents that such a thing could never happen here. <laughs> With an air of excitement, Toronto's downtown would seem a world away. But the security clampdown tonight clearly illustrates the countermeasures to a threat. Layers of trucks blocking vehicles from getting near crowds of Leaf fans and a much larger than usual police presence. I feel a lot safer than I usually would. And because it's a Leaf, so I'm good. I'm coming here and I'm enjoying myself. We're not going to let fear take over the day, so we're going to make sure we're going to go out there and have fun. Because at the end of the day, that, that's what you know, the individual might want to take away from us, is that sense of freedom. But we're not going to let that take over, so we're going to enjoy the day over here. Words can't even describe on how awful this uh, tragic event is. But if you look around, this is what brings everyone together. So as one, we're going to unite. And uh, like I said, uh, we'll, we'll continue to be strong. Tonight's security tightening is actually round two because less than a month ago, Toronto police announced that they were going to be clamping down on security around big events, even blocking people from parking underground unless they could prove they were residents. Security experts pointed to the threat of a vehicle being used as a weapon. The mayor back then alluded to it too. It's 2018 and we've seen incidents happen unfortunately outside of sports venues and concert venues and so on around the world that would have caused us as we did, uh, we meaning the police, the security officials and everybody else to review uh, security. Ladies and gentlemen, please rise if you're able to and remove your hats. The Leafs Bruins game began tonight in silence in a big city an opportunity to remember those killed and a reminder of the danger that lurks. And David is outside Toronto City Hall tonight, a popular place for tourists with local residents too. And this attack clearly has rattled some nerves. And so what are people doing to, to counteract that uneasiness? Well, you know, Ian, you see that the landmark Toronto sign behind me is dimmed, but on porches, the lights are in fact very much on, particularly in that Young and Finch, Young and Shepherd area, the area of this city, the uptown, downtown where all of this took place. So many people unable to get home because traffic and transit was so complicated this evening. Some areas were shut down. And so those porch lights are on, indicating to people they are welcome to come into that house, to stay there if necessary. People opening their homes, opening their doors to help out one another on this a day of tragedy in this city. A gesture we've seen in other cities around the world. Thanks, David. As Toronto mourns, condolences have been coming in from around the world. British Foreign Secretary Boris Johnson, who's here in Toronto for the G7 meeting, wrote on Twitter, very sad to see the news of the incident in Toronto earlier today as I was visiting the city. My thoughts with those affected, their families and friends, and the emergency services personnel responding. And from the French president, Emmanuel Macron, his tweet translated from French reads, I express my profound solidarity with the Canadian people after the tragedy that just struck the city of Toronto. And the U.S. vice president, Mike Pence, writing, the president and I are closely monitoring the attack on innocent people in Toronto this afternoon. We are with the Canadian people tonight as they grieve the loss of life and injured. The American people stand shoulder to shoulder with our neighbours in Canada. Still ahead on the national. From those first 911 calls to the arrest, it was just 26 minutes. We'll take you through the dramatic timeline and the takedown. Plus, voices of shock and grief will bring you eyewitness stories from the scene. But first, take a look at this. 
an impromptu show of support just north of the attack strip at Young and Finch. Community members set up a memorial where people can share messages of sadness and condolence on poster boards. Just some of the messages, praying for the block. Love trumps overall. And we will never forget you. Just some of the moments of grief this afternoon in Toronto, the aftermath of an attack that happened so fast but made time stand still for the people who were there. It all started around 1.30 this afternoon. Which way was he going? Police started getting calls about a van that had driven up onto a sidewalk fast, mowing down everything in its path. Well, there's people coming out from the BMO bank and they start yelling to the best pedestrians saying, watch out, watch out, move out of the way, because the guy just storming down on, on Yonge Street on the sidewalk. I was going right, right by the side on the third lane. Uh, the guy was coming out from the second, accelerating fast, cutting me over, going right towards this homeless guy over there, uh, hitting him, and the guy flew up and flew up from up in the sky. The guy just literally flew all the way towards that sidewalk. Here's where it happened. Young and Finch, as it's called, is in the north end area of Toronto called North York. The car mounted the sidewalk here and drove south at what witnesses described as about 60 to 70 kilometers an hour. They saw him hit so many people and it all happened so fast. The first thing I saw, it was like, it was one cop car and they were, they were with, they were doing CPR on somebody and there was a group of surrounded and down the street, um, more cop cars started coming and then fire trucks and ambulances and all bunched up so fast. I saw people laying uh, and being CPR'd and stuff like that. And then a short time later, they were putting blankets over them. The driver got away, but he didn't get far. Less than half an hour later, about three kilometers south at Points Avenue, another tense scene. The driver out of a white rider van waved what appeared to be a gun at the officer who chased him. Clearly, the cop knew it wasn't a weapon, and the driver was taken into custody. Uh, we obviously don't have a lot of detail we can provide as yet, uh, but we know there were casualties. Witnesses had reported seeing bodies covered with tarps. It was clear people were dead, but it would be two hours before officials would confirm the awful toll. We can confirm for you tonight, right now, we have nine people that are dead, 16 that are injured. By this evening, that death toll had risen to 10. The suspect, 25-year-old Alec Manassian, a student at a Toronto area college. Around 7 this evening, CBC News confirmed there was no terror link to the attack. Now, across social media, there's been all sorts of praise for the officer who arrested the attack suspect. The takedown was done without incident, not a shot fired, and it was all over in less than a minute. The CBC's Vicodopia has a look at the special training officers received to keep dangerous arrests from getting out of hand. It's a tense moment. An officer arrives on the scene alone to face a suspect who appears armed and defiant, ignoring the order to surrender. Still ignoring the warnings, Manassian moves in on the officer, who stays cool, realizing there's no gun, and the suspect surrenders. It's over in less than 30 seconds with no shots fired and no more casualties as bystanders record the whole thing. The man was, uh, was not cooperating. He kept on taping steps forward and it is at that point that the officer, I believe, realized that that was not a gun in his hand. So he put away his gun, he took out his baton, he went forward, the man saw that the cop will not shoot him so he gave up right there and then. Police takedowns don't always end so peacefully. Drop the mic. 
After a series of high-profile shootings, Toronto police's use of force faced scrutiny and formal calls to change their tactics by de-escalating standoffs. Stay down! Drop the knife! Drop the knife! Stop! Stay down! New regular training stresses negotiation to avoid using lethal force when possible. This retired officer says the solo arrest of Manassian was textbook perfect. He acted um, smartly, tactically and courageously. A standoff de-escalated and a suspect arrested to face the consequences. Vic Adopia, CBC News, Toronto. For more on next steps for investigators, I'm joined by Phil Gursky in Ottawa, president and CEO of Borealis and a former CSIS analyst. Phil, thanks for being here. Let's start with that last part, what we just saw there. Were you surprised at police response and how quickly that was contained? Well, I think hats off, kudos to the officer. He clearly received very good training. He followed that training to the, to the, to the, to the nth degree and he's able to neutralize a guy who had just carried out a, a heinous attack. And, and now the guy's alive, he's not dead, which means you can question him. And you can, and you can hopefully find out why he did what he did. So I think this is a tremendous uh, kudos to, to, to Toronto Police Services, the training they give their officers, and this particular officer who did what he was trained to do. Okay, and one of the things police are going to want to know is obviously motive here, although it mm -hmm. appears from uh, government sources and elsewhere that there's no national security threat. So where does the investigation go from here if that is the case? Well, you know, I listened to Mark Saunders. I listened to the minister talk about this. So what they're saying, really, Rosemary, is that they don't, as of now, there's no information, there's no intelligence that suggests a national security link. But, you know, we're, what, seven, eight hours after this? There's a lot that needs to be learned. So what they're going to do is basically ask him. Maybe he's cooperating, mm -hmm. maybe he's not. So maybe he'll tell them why he did what he did. They'll look at his social media presence. They'll probably get a warrant to look at his cell phone, to look at his email. Um, they'll probably get a warrant to search his, his apartment or his house. They'll talk to family, they'll talk to friends, they'll talk to workmates to see, was, was there anything amiss? Was this guy going down a certain pathway and was there anything noticed? So it's, it's really, a, it's kind of a concentric circles, if you will. Yeah. Start with the suspect, go from there and see what you can find out. You know, off the top, we talked about things that London has done to prevent these kinds of attacks with vehicles because they have become all too common in that city. Things like even pre-screening people when they rent vans. Is there a way to prevent an incident like this, a lone attacker in a rented vehicle? I, I don't think so, Rosemary. Unless he's already on your radar, he's under surveillance or he's under investigation for another purpose, it's really, really hard. And, you know, you talk about, yeah, rental places should do background checks. Well, uh, how many vehicles are rented in Toronto on a given day? I mean, how can you do that in real time? And secondly, you know, you can put ballers up outside the ACC or outside, you know, Parliament or, 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 or Queen's Park. You can't put ballers up up and down Young Street, the longest street in Canada. So we really got to be a little more realistic as to what can be done in this case. So sure, lock down and, and, and put a lot of security in the, in the venues where you expect a lot of people. But we can't make the city into a fortress. And I don't think we want to go down that pathway. So the only way then is what, uh, sort of watch for and monitor chatter, try and get, a, get ahead of these people, assess them out online. Even that becomes very difficult to monitor someone 24-7. Oh, you can't. You know, we, we learned that, right, with, with, uh, in, in Strathroy with Aaron Driver. He was on yeah. a peace bomb, but he wasn't being monitored because he had other priorities at the time. And, and, and Canadians don't realize how much time and effort this takes to monitor somebody. So, yeah, if you're watching him, great, you might get lucky, but the vast majority of people aren't being watched 24-7, and, and nor should they be in, in a democratic society like Canada. Phil Gursky, thank you for perspective tonight. I appreciate it, sir. Thanks, Rosemary. Now, for those who saw what happened, it will stay with them for life. Amir Bahimeya is a college student, and he was heading to school when he saw the van attack. We heard a, a little bit from him earlier in the show. Here's a little bit more of what he had to say about it. I just came out from, like, a subway station on the chauffeur. And I saw like the crazy van, like a rental van, hitting the people one on one, one after one. And uh, there is like, there was like old, I saw the old man going up and going down. That's the all. I, and the people like scream and going around. The police like help to, came to help the people. And then the all, I saw them, the all. He drove really fast and like crazy people. And I saw the like, I don't know, how can I say it? The car, car seat from a baby going up like that. I don't know the baby hitting or no. I hopefully, yeah, hopefully the baby was fine.
We'll take you back to Toronto and the scene of the attack in a few minutes. But first, here are some of the other stories we're watching tonight. The suspect in yesterday's shooting rampage at a Nashville Waffle House restaurant is in custody. Travis Reinking was captured today in a wooded area after being on the run for more than 30 hours. He's accused of opening fire inside the restaurant and killing four people. The motive for the attack still unclear. Also tonight, former Ontario Progressive Conservative leader Patrick Brown is suing CTV for $8 million. His lawyers filed a statement of claim today accusing CTV of defamation. They were the first to report allegations of sexual misconduct against Brown from two women. After that report, Brown resigned as leader and was later removed from the PC caucus. But he denies any wrongdoing. And news tonight that former U.S. President George H.W. Bush is in hospital. According to a family spokesperson, he was admitted yesterday, just one day after the funeral for his wife, Barbara. He reportedly contracted an infection that spread to his blood, but he is said to be responding to treatment. Well, on a day of difficult news, there was one bright spot. Prince William and Kate welcomed a baby boy to their family. And that resulted in a mad rush to the bookies to get in on the latest royal name game. Margaret Evans has that story from London. Royal baby lady. For the arrival of royal baby number three, no dress rehearsal needed. Read about the royal baby. As soon as news broke that the Duchess of Cambridge had gone into labor, everyone in position. I jumped out of the bed after hearing the news that Katie is being brought in St. Mary's. I just jumped. I've not had my breakfast even. <laughs> Loyal fans camped out on the curb. Great clumps of photographers peered through the looking glass and royal commentators commented. Well, this child is going to be fifth in line to the throne, so um, not right up there in terms of Prince George being in the direct line, but still a very senior member of the royal family. It wasn't long before the ceremonial easel went up outside Buckingham Palace, announcing the birth of a baby boy. His big brother and sister arriving for introductions at St. Mary's Hospital in central London with their father, Prince William, soon after. For those who might have missed it, there were other less formal announcements. My mum's just sent me a text message. I think they may have just had a baby boy, but my mum's not very good at texting. Before you knew it, though, confirmation was at hand. Proud parents emerging through those mirrored doors with their baby for his first cameo. Still unnamed. Odds on favourite with the bookies, Arthur. Margaret Evans, CBC News, London. And we are going to take a short break. When we come back, more special coverage of the attack in Toronto ahead on The National. to expect was never going to be. You have to always fight for your family, whatever is left. You're gonna lose your home. There is no more time. And even though that I do not think that I'm all that successful, I have what I need. Life is pretty good. Hey. I'm Michelle Parisi. I want to tell you something about my podcast, Alone, A Love Story. When I first started writing it five years ago, it wasn't a diary. It was a cautionary tale, a call to arms. We've all been disappointed, made mistakes, tried to forgive, and we've all believed in love, clung to hope. More of all that in season two of Alone, A Love Story. Stick with me. CBC TV app. Download now. This is a tragic, tragic situation, and uh, our first thoughts are with the, the victims and their families. 
Toronto, a city in mourning tonight. 10 people dead, more than 50, and 15 more are in hospital after a van plowed into pedestrians on a sidewalk in the city's north end. The suspect, 25 year old Alec Manassian, he is in custody tonight after being arrested at the scene. No word from police on the potential motive, but officials say there's no evidence to suggest that he's connected to any terrorist groups. One of the interesting things here, and this is a big city, as we all know, is, is leaving the CBC, coming up here in the northern part of Toronto. Along Front Street, it seemed like everyone was thinking about the Maple Leafs game. On the long subway ride, I looked around and I, and I had the sense it's almost as if people hadn't seen the news or it hadn't sunk in yet. It was so different from, say, Humboldt or Parkland, where everywhere you looked, you realized people were mourning. And then you finally get here. And throughout our time here, people are walking by solemnly. Some people were bringing flowers. Uh, a big city with uh, lots of different kind of reactions tonight. And yet, Ian, you say that, and I think about the days to come, and we may very well see a call out for help. I mean, online, I've seen at least one fundraiser trying to raise a million dollars. This is to cover fund uh, funeral expenses, but also to reach out to help victims' families, and also Canadian Blood Services. We've seen some folks on Twitter reaching out to them asking, hey, do you need donations in the wake of what's happened? And they've said, look, over the course of the year, we get enough regular donations so that we have supply for emergency situations such as this, but if you still want to reach out, if you still want to help, they always accept donations. And there are going to be call-outs, too, uh, for someone to do something, you know, for, for police to sort of tighten up the city. I, I was just looking at the bridge behind me, Westminster, that has been reinforced so many times for so many different types of threats, including recently against vehicle at attacks. And just yet one street over, it, you know, you look at it again and it's wide open. It's, it's so frustrating for police, so difficult to deal with. And, you know, after the Parliament Hill attack, they did make some security changes to make it more difficult, for instance, for cars to get on Parliament Hill. But even today, even as this was all unfolding in the hours after, there were tourists and people wandering around Parliament Hill just, uh, just like it has always been. So, um, Keep yeah, in some mind, solace there. This story is going to get a lot more gripping and a lot more emotional, I think, when we start hearing the victims' names and hearing their stories, people who were just walking along these streets at shortly after noon when uh, lives ended and other lives changed. That is The National for April 23rd. Good night. Good night.